wasn't a member of New York State when I was in the show. Oh, that's, that's all right. <laughs> so. That's all right. Today is the 22nd of July, 2009. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. Uh, my name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name Edward, and your date and place of birth? Edward Hepp, uh, 101237, Patterson, New Jersey. And did you grow up in Patterson? Outside of Patterson, Hawthorne. Northern. It used to be known as Northern Patterson there. All right. And did you complete high school? In yes. Yeah. And what year did you graduate? 55. All right. And uh, did you uh, further your education at that point or did you yeah, go? Yeah, I went to Paul Smith College in uh, upstate New York. Oh, all right. And what did you study there? Oh, it was surveying and, uh, and, and forestry. Mm -hmm. It was a combined uh, subjects then. Uh, since separated it, but mm -hmm. it was one uh, one course at the time. And at that point, uh, did you work in, in that field, or did yes. you go into the... Yeah, I okay. worked uh, initially as a surveyor, and then one of the fellows that I was at school with had his own business, because he got in under the GI Bill, that was the last year they could get under the GI Bill, from Korea, and he contacted me, and I worked for him for about a year, and. Uh, Pruning trees, climbing trees, and pruning trees. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, when did you go into the service? It was January of '58. Did you enlist, or were you drafted? I enlisted. Uh, I was about to get drafted, or whatever, you know. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll have a choice. I'll get an education or do something. You know, I'll, mm -hmm. you know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, I went in in January of '58. Okay, and in, in which uh, branch of the service? The army. And, and why did you choose the army? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. I just thought, well, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I just did. All right. And where did you go for your basic training? Uh, uh, Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. Fort Dix is one of the old wooden World War II barracks out there at the end of the airstrip there. Or, uh, McGuire Air Base there, mm -hmm. right at the end of the strip there, right. And how was your basic training? Well, it was one of the worst winters they'd had in New Jersey <laughs> in God knows how long, right. So yeah. we were out shoveling the streets with entrenching tools and what well, oh, yeah, it was quite a, but it was, you know, I guess it mm -hmm. was typical. Everybody's got a basic, mm -hmm. you know, basic yeah. training story or two. Yeah, well. I mean, it was cold. We couldn't we couldn't mop we couldn't mop the floors because they'd freeze. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the water would freeze on the floors. The wind blew. Uh, they issued a sleeping bag so that we could sleep in the barracks, and you'd wake up and you had snow on top of you in the morning. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you have the old coal stoves? Yeah, the old coal stoves, and then they lose the fire or whatever. And like once a week, we'd sneak down to the repo section, which was the new barracks. And, Sneak in one of those bars, take a shower or whatever, you know. It was, mm -hmm. yeah, it, no, it was interesting. You know, uh -huh. We got through it. All right. And once you completed your basic training, uh, where did they send you? We, I stayed at Dick's for advanced infantry. Oh, okay. Um, and, oh. and that was in the newer barracks, what we call the pink palaces down there. Okay. Was that it, training any better than basic? Oh, well, yeah. It was certainly, you know, it was in the summer and, and yeah, the conditions were better, and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you had, in basic, you know, they were trying to wash people out, or whatever, you know, yeah. so you had a, you had a bigger mix, you, you knew that people that were in advance were going to pretty much stay with you, or at least, you know, mm -hmm. some of them were, yeah, so, um, yeah, it, it was definitely a, a, a higher grade of, of soldier, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. And once you completed your in infantry advance, mm -hmm. where did you go next? Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And what was what was Fort Bragg like? Well, it it was for me it was interesting because I'd never been south, and it was you know you knew you were in the south, mm -hmm. um, and well the, the the whole training was much more intense certainly you know it was uh, it was in the eighty second. And, uh, oh, you were in the 82nd Airborne? Yeah. So, did you go to jump school? Oh, yeah. 
And did you go to jump school before you went to Bragg, or no, no, at Bragg. At Bragg, okay. So at that, that time there were there were, I think, three jump schools. You had Fort Bragg, you had Fort Campbell, and uh, and one in Bennington, I believe. Uh, Fort the Bennington. The officers went to. Yeah, Georgia. Is that Benny? Yeah, yeah. Fort Benny. Yeah, Fort Benny. Uh, yeah, but we went. Yeah, we, we went to uh, to Fort Bragg. In fact, well, we we hung around a while waiting for a class to form, or I guess to get enough people or whatever. And in that time, <laughs> we were put on alert. Uh, spent three days on the tarmac at Pope Air Force Base, and our our. Uh, Sergeants and, and whatever who were in charge of us. And your first jump's going to be a combat jump because we were ready to go into Cuba at the time. Uh -huh. so we had ammo. They issued us ammo. I mean, we were ready. We had parachutes. We were ready to go. We hadn't spent a day in jump school. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Really? Yeah, it was a big joke. Yeah, yeah. You know, your first jump's going to be a combat jump. <laughs> well, we were kind of. Oh my God! We were ready to go. It was funny. So, yeah. so you hadn't had any of the training no, at all? No training at all. I mean, just. Uh, you know, your PT, your physical yeah. fitness stuff, but no, we were waiting for a class to form. And uh, <laughs> and we got up one of these alerts and the whole tarmac was full of troopers ready to go down to Cuba for some reason or other. I yeah. don't know what little blow up it was, but it was, would have been, well, it would have been the spring of 58, whatever what, uh -huh. what was going on at that time. Was, uh, that, okay. So. Well, once you did get into jump school, what was that like? Was it pretty difficult? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was summer. It was hot. Um, you know, you could, you, the, their emphasis was certainly on physical fitness, you know. So, yeah, it, it, they, they washed a lot of people out. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, What was your first jump like? Was it scary? No, it wasn't. No, I don't. I didn't, no, I wouldn't say scary. I, I thought it was... Uh, I, I just remember like roller coaster, uh, just you know a lot of exhilarance as far as, man, this is you know this is the greatest thrill ride you can uh, you know you you could get better than Coney Island or uh, you know uh, a, a, any amusement ride. I just thought it was terrific. Mm -hmm. and, no, I, and I I mean I know there's guys that were what we call master blasters had their master wings and they they said they never had a daylight jump. You know, <laughs> well. We still, yeah, it just was different. Yeah, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved jumping there. So, how many how many jumps did you make in school? Boy, I don't remember. I think it was only five. Five. I think it was five to to you know to qualify. Um, yeah, yeah, five, and then you're done, and then you go to your unit, and then you uh, depends on what what you're okay. doing is for. You had to jump once every three months. But most generally, there was always training, uh, you know, some sort of mm -hmm. training going on that, that you didn't have to, because they would have rosters occasionally if you needed to jump, to stay on jump status. Uh -huh. They called Hollywood jumps, that they would try to get people, uh, you know, to stay on, uh, stay on jump status. But um, that didn't happen very often. Usually they kept you going, you know, uh -huh. with... with exercises, this and that, whatever, occasionally. And sometimes they, they just didn't have the fuel. Mm -hmm. The Air Force couldn't get fuel enough to, you know, fly people, so, but. So, so did you stay at Bragg once you completed Stayed at your Bragg until January of 59. They were forming a group to, uh, there were two battle groups going to uh, Germany, and you had to have so much time, and so I had to extend like for six months or something like that uh, to go to Germany. They were going over as a T.O. and E outfit, mm -hmm. uh, 505 and a 504 were going to Germany. Uh, first time an airborne outfit had been in Germany since the 11th, I guess, who were in, they had some problems and stuff and over there. Kind of took the airborne out of Germany for a while, but mm -hmm. we were the first group to go back in. Now, what was your mission going to be over in Germany? Um, I guess not being you know that high up uh, at the time uh, was kind of a buffer for uh, for Russians. And every time we went, they went on alert in Germany. They most generally move us out someplace mm -hmm. as a 
counterattack uh, type unit, you know, that the Russians didn't know where they would uh, deploy us. We wouldn't go to the front lines. We mm -hmm. Sometimes we went to France, sometimes we, we would move around in Germany, different places. Every time we, we went on alert, it was usually something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess that's what it was, that they could counterattack with us if, you mm -hmm. know, if the ball went up or whatever, you know. Um, but we weren't always <laughs> privy to what, what was going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, Whereabouts in Germany were you based on? Well, the main force was based in Mainz, uh, Germany, which is on the Rhine. Uh, we were in a splinter group. There was two companies uh, that were across the river in, in the Air Force sector, which was Wiesbaden, which was quite nice because, again, it was the Air Force section. So mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't your typical army town kind of a thing that kind of gets, you know. Mm -hmm. You get problems, just getting along with each other type of thing there. You know, there's fights and bar, you can't go here, you can't go there, you know, it's just your usual pain yeah. in the tail type stuff there. So, Boys Button was quite nice, because the Air Force was a little more civilized than we might be. You know. How did you get along with the civilian population? Well, I, I would say fairly well. We had some problems with them as far as, like, exercising, we, you know, they'd want to count, and we'd run right through towns and stuff like that. We ran every day, um, pretty much, and, and they didn't like the cadence and stuff, so then they, they stopped all that <laughs> singing and going, because it was usually early in the morning, you know, uh -huh. we'd be out there. So there was a, some little friction like that. Uh, the fact that we were airborne was actually a benefit, because they respected the airborne a lot more than they did the regular army. Mm -hmm. um, talking with some of them, because there were still a number of people uh, you know, that had survived the Second World War. And um, uh, Fallschirmjäger, oh, Fallschirmjäger, yeah, you know. They, they, they respected training, they, they, you know, certain things they respected. So we, we got it, we had it probably a little easier than, say, a normal uh, army outfit would have, mm -hmm. I, I think. Uh, it's, it's probably just my opinion, but uh, yeah, just, I did, uh, try to involve myself in a number of ways with, with local population um, to, you know, to learn. And, and you know, my, my uh, grandparents or great-grandparents came from Germany, so, you know, was a, there was an interest there. Mm -hmm. So I, I made an effort to kind of learn the people and, and, and how they thought and whatever else. Yeah, I, like I say, I think we got along better than probably some other outfits did because of the fact that we we were respected a little more. Mm -hmm. Now, what were your uh, barracks like? They were an old brick SS, whatever, you know, compound. They call them concerns. Mm -hmm. um, walled in, broken glass on top of a eight foot wall, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. typical of what you see in World War II movies there, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, fairly. Uh, I guess austere, you might say, or whatever. It was, yeah, it was what you would expect. A castle looking building, you know, uh -huh. you know brick or stuff. I mean, it was brick. Uh, old walled in, and, and you know, uh, it wasn't open to the public at all, mm -hmm. type of thing. So. Now, what were your personal living quarters like? They were like a room like this. I mean, you had, uh, well, we had a whole squad. Uh, I was in a, a weapons squad, so you had whatever eleven guys in you know in a room. Mm -hmm. um, they were nice, you know, tile floors, uh, as modern as they could be. Naturally, you know, they were well painted, well cleaned. Yeah, everything was clean. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, what about your latrine facilities? Anything out of the ordinary? No, they were you know just a bunch of. Facilities lined up in a row, you know, all mm -hmm. wide open. Certainly, you know, there was no privacy whatsoever. But mm -hmm. that was, you played sports or you did anything like that. It was no different than you know, mm -hmm. being in high school, so to speak. You know, it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was just all open back then. The privacy wasn't a thing, and you didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. and, and how often did they send you out on training maneuvers? Oh gosh, I mean, it would vary. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you'd go out for a month or two at a time mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, right. I mean, it might be a couple of days. Um, they vary. Um, and uh, that, 
was, well, let's see, I'm trying to think of my dates a little bit. And that was, uh, for most of the time I was over, then the last year or so, a year and a half, they formed, um, there was this lieutenant, uh, Herbert, I guess, Hubert, Herbert. Anyway, he convinced the army that uh, because of the new concept with nuclear weapons and such, that there wouldn't be a front line. There'd be pockets of, you know, groups. And that, mm -hmm. uh, at that time there was no, well, I think I got this right, there were, was no established uh, units, uh, ranger units. There was a ranger school that people went to and then went back to their regular unit. Mm -hmm. He formed this, what they called the experimental ranger platoon. And you had to meet certain criteria to get in there, whatever, which I, I belonged to. And, and we trained for like one NATO game. We trained for like eight months for this one NATO game. Uh, and using this concept of patrolling between ambushes, uh, you know, uh, different, what rangers are trained to do. Mm -hmm. Patrol for either information or, or destroy or, you know, ambush or whatever, your different uh, tech techniques that, um, that rangers uh, are, are trained for. And we kind of blew the NATO games apart pretty much. Uh, mm -hmm. Had a hell of a good time with it, from doing just crazy stuff or whatever, you know. But it was, nobody was shooting back at you, so. Mm -hmm. um, now what about your equipment? Did you find that adequate? Oh Especially yeah. Especially in the cold weather? Yeah, we, yeah, we, 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 we almost generally, yeah, I think we were always, um, for the stuff that was out there at the time, yeah, we always had good equipment. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the part of the problem with, uh, with with once I was in the Ranger platoon was that most generally you had a, whatever you had it was on your back, mm -hmm. so you went you went as light as possible, you know, and so yeah we froze our tails off a few times, but that was you know that was only because you didn't have trucks backing you up. You were yeah. you were trying to infiltrate or trying to do something that, you know like I say is along um, the Ranger line, you know, so. But it was, it was it was interesting. I learned a lot. So. Now, now, did you carry the uh, the old M1 Garand or oh, the yeah. M14? No, no, I never saw never saw an M14. No, we had the Garand up until I got out, which was in '62, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was uh, you know it was the old LMG, the 3.5 rocket launcher, you know the BAR carbine, the M1 carbine. Mm -hmm. Now, did you carry the Grand most of the time? No, I uh, I was in a weapons squad, so I was either a 3.5 rocket launcher with a with a 1911-45, uh, or uh, or it was on the LMG, uh, the 30 light, mm -hmm. and um, we, either one of those two most generally is what I carried. So and then you just carried the sidearm, mm -hmm. so uh, because the the 30 light was. 35 pounds or whatever like that. You didn't have much room for carrying on <laughs> anything other than that, plus some ammo, you know. I mean, when you jumped with one of those in ammo, you know, you prop, prop wash didn't take you very far. You just went straight down you know, uh -huh. until the chute opened up there, you know. But you jumped in a bag. You had a, what they call a GP bag, general purpose bag. They just loaded that. And they went as much as 150 pounds worth of stuff in one of those bags. Now was that on a rope below you? So well, no, it was attached to you until you, you weren't supposed to lower it until you were close to the ground so that it wouldn't swing into, uh, you know, shoots and stuff I like see. that. Yeah, you held that between you. In fact, to get rid of it, you had these quick releases. You had to push the thing out, wrap your legs around it so that, because if you tripped one release before the other, well then the other one hung up and you couldn't. Oh. And you rode that thing all the way in, which was not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, because you had this extra speed going down. But yeah, there was like a 15 foot lowering strap mm -hmm. that went, went, went with that GP bag, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, it was, it was different again, you know. Now you were over there for a year and a half? I was, no, I was over, I was in Germany, I think for 33 months total. Oh, 33 months, wow. Yeah. Now, did you uh, learn to speak any of the language? Yes, yeah, some. Uh, being a lazy uh, 
you know, beer drinking American there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the Germans I hung out with, which was too bad, spoke English fairly well. And, mm -hmm. and I should have, you know, insisted that they teach me more German. But, uh, you know, you, you, you take the easy way out. And mm -hmm. We were having too busy having fun when we were in town, you know. Mm -hmm. I, uh, what did you think of the German beer? <laughs> oh. Gosh, it was like sitting down to a full course meal. So uh -huh. you had to chew it before you could swallow it. That was, that was lovely. Yeah, it was great stuff. <laughs> My gosh, for fifty cents when you first got over here, you, you you get a you know get a hangover. And it was fifty cents worth of beer. And it was uh, it was phenomenal stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, don't know if I could get any of it down today because uh -huh. I don't I don't drink anymore. But I used to do my fair share, <clears throat> yes, we kept the economy going as best mm -hmm. we could. Now, did you have a car over there? I did after a while. You weren't allowed to initially. You had to, um, well, you either had to be an E5 or uh, or have a, if an E4 had, you had so much time in, I guess. Uh, so, um, so initially, uh, for a while, see, we went over as a teal and E outfit. You couldn't make grade. You know, when I came back to the States, I had something like 20, 28 months in grade. They, what rank were you? Uh, E4 when I came back. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to this, uh, they sent me back to um, to Bragg and, and company commander, I guess he thought I was a screw up because he, he asked me, he said, how many months in grade you guys? I said, 28. Well, he couldn't believe it. And, you know, what, what have you got? Well, it was a T.O. in the outfit. You just, yeah. there, there just was no place to go. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, wasn't really anybody's fault. I never got into any trouble. Well, I got into trouble before I got out of basic, but that's a whole different story. But. Now, now, what kind of car did you have in Germany? I had an MGA, which was one of the big mistakes of my lifetime. It was a terrible car, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, we had some fun hot riding around. And, uh -huh. Being able to see more. The whole thing was being able to see more of, of Germany than you could take off on a weekend or, you know, an, an afternoon and just tool around and again meet people, and go to different places, you know, mm -hmm. see wine festivals along the Rhine because we we're right on the Rhine. I mean, water was right there mm -hmm. alongside the Caserne. So yeah, it was it was it was fun. I, I should have taken more advantage of what I, you know when I was over here, but. You know, too busy mm -hmm. having fun. Now, when you uh, came back, did you come back with most of the unit, or no? No, that was in fact that was a kind of a strange thing. We don't know. Nobody really ever knew what happened. I was in. Well, we were in that Ranger platoon. We went down someplace in southern Germany. I don't. I don't even remember where. As a PR thing, we were going to go through the German Airborne School and then go to the German Ranger School. And we got through the the um, the airborne school, and we'd done a we we had formed they they had formed them we had formed we, I was part of the demonstration team where they did oh just uh, different taking out people uh, self defense blah blah you know repelling and and that kind of stuff we would do for VIPs or you know stuff and so we were down there and, and like I say it was mostly a PR thing. Uh, we went through the, the airborne school, and then we just started the uh, the ranger school. And I get this thing; they pulled me out of there. What's what's going on? Well, you got a ticket back home. I don't know. What the heck is this all about? Well, anyway, you didn't, and they couldn't change it, whatever. So I, mm -hmm. I, I was on my way way back to the states. I don't know why. So I was just one out of, you know, whatever. People's times were up at different times, but no, I, I don't know if that uh, where that outfit is today or not, or, you know, where the 505 is, but... Uh, uh, well, I, I forgot to ask you earlier, how did you initially get to Germany? On a boat. On a boat, okay. In the middle of January, and the waves crashing. <laughs> oh, it was a fun trip. Uh -huh. It was a fun trip. Did, did you get seasick? I did after about four days. Yeah, it was. I mean, everybody was sick. I got cocky after a while because everybody was sick and I wasn't. And I, I think I started drinking a little too much water there and whatever, too much liquid, and then I got sick. I mean, sailors were sick. Mm -hmm. You could hear the prop out of the water half the time. You know, as you'd break through and boom, 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 boom. 
Oh, yeah, it was, a, it was a fun trip. Wow. Decks were off limits all the time. On the way back, guys were sleeping on the decks. It was in summer. And oh, so you went we, went back on the ship? Oh, tubs. yeah, yeah. We went wow. the long way around, yeah. But the, coming back wasn't like I say. The weather was beautiful. And the Atlantic was like a lake, and, and you'd sleep up on a deck or whatever. It was beautiful, you know. It was great. Watch the whales and watch the porpoise and whatever, you know. But yeah, mm -hmm. going over, you didn't see any of that. Now, where did you leave from when you went over? Where did we leave? Some place. Going over. Boy, I can't remember. Um, had to be in South, uh, North Carolina somewhere. So I don't know. I don't know of any ports, but okay. it was close. You know, fair, relatively close to Fort Bragg. Um, I don't know what port is out there. But All right. you know, we went on a couple of ships and off we went. And, and whereabouts did you land? Was it in oh, France? Oh, it or? was. Um, okay, was it Amsterdam or was it Bremerhaven? Um, because then we got on a train into Germany. Yeah, we all loaded on a, they had a whole train for us. I think it was Amsterdam that we came, we went into. Okay. Uh, and then loaded up and, well, no, it couldn't have been because we didn't go through customs. Well, I don't know about customs at that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we had the whole train, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like. And then you took a train to Germany? Right. Yeah. Okay. The whole group. I mean, we went, you know, like I said, we went over as a group. Yeah. So we had the whole, the whole train, and uh, and and went down to uh, wherever. I don't remember coming in. What where we came into? We must have come into Mainz, and then we got trucked over. Like I said, a company I belonged with went across the river to um, to Wiesbaden, mm -hmm. which was. Now, when you went back to the states, did you land back at the Brooklyn Bragg Navy Yard? Uh -huh. Little Brooklyn Navy Yard, maybe. Uh, you know, and, uh, okay, we got got a actually got my orders there. I didn't know where the heck I was going or what was happening. He said, "Oh, yeah, you know, you're you're T O N A there, right? You're going down to Fort Bragg there." And I was getting great. So we basically went down there and trained Rotsies or. Did you get any kind of leave to go home? Yeah, you could if you wanted. If you wanted to leave, so I took a, I don't know I took a short leave and went home. Some of my folks and stuff. I hadn't seen them in 33 months or mm -hmm. whatever, you know. So, yeah, we, I, I took a short leave and then went down and showed up at Bragg. And uh, back at Bragg, did you go to your to your old unit? Just a, no, no, no. My old unit was still in Germany. No. Sent me to 325, which is just another, you know, battle group there, mm -hmm. another airplane battle. How did they treat you? Well, like I say, the company commander was suspicious because I had so much time in grade. Uh -huh. <laughs> he thought I was a screw up, I guess. Uh, but I was disappointed in, in the lack of training, the lack of knowledge, because we had to know basically two jobs, two positions ahead of us. Uh, to uh, well, that was. That, that was, I guess, was initiated by the EIP, the expert infantry, to get the expert infantry, infantry men's badge, and you had to have all this extra information. So, like I say, I got back to the States, and I just, I couldn't believe the, um, the lack of training that, that, mm -hmm. that these guys had, a lack of knowledge. But, mm -hmm. but I'd, yeah. I'd been around a lot, most of these guys were kids. Mm -hmm. so, now, now, did they use you as, like, cadre? Well, they didn't initially. I was put into a weapon squad, and one of the, one of the first uh, inspections we we uh, we had, I was sitting there, and I had my expert expert infantryman badge, and I had my airborne wings, and then I had my German airborne wings because they we mm -hmm. were allowed to wear them in Germany, so I had them on my uniform. And the company commander said, "What the hell are those here?" They're not authorized. You got to take those off. Okay, I'll take them off. You know? So, and then he started questioning me, and, and it was interesting because I, I thought, "Geez, what am I? A new kid on the block, I guess." Because he was sniping away there. I mean, he wasn't didn't seem like a bad guy, but he, boy, he was pumping me for, and I was just spitting out stuff, just like I was supposed to. You know, well, he, uh, 
And then he asked me how many months of grade I had. He went apoplectic. He said, what do you mean 28 months of grade? 28 months of grade. So later, after the inspection, he called me down to his office and he handed me these acting jack stripes. And he said, I want you to put these on. I said, well, all due respect, I, said, I don't think I want to take the job unless I get paid for it. I said, I got the time and grade. You want to make me sergeant? That's fine, but I, I don't really feel like I need these acting jack stripes, you know. So no, 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 I put them on anyway. So I put them on for, um, I guess, about two weeks later, they, they, they gave me E5. So. It was, but it was kind of comical initially because, it, it, yeah, there was just, you know, kids. To, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was an old man, except for, you know, some of the cadre that was there. Certainly there were guys that had a lot more time in the service than I did. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, is an E4, like when you were over in Germany, did you have to pull a lot of details like KP and that? Or no, no, KP, that was all, um, I don't know, they took a couple of bucks a month from our pay and uh, Germans did KP oh, for see. us. Um, and initially we had to pull guard duty, but then they formed a special security uh, detail out of the ranks and, and mm -hmm. that's all those guys did was, was guard duty. So, so we didn't do that. Um, but basically we were ready to go. In fact, once we, it was interesting when we were in, when they formed the Ranger platoon, we, we never had an inspection. They never had an inspection. Your lockers looked like hell. They didn't care as long as you produced in the field. And I mean, you know, and you, you we worked, we worked hard. Mm -hmm. But when we were in garrison, we were pretty much left alone, which was quite nice. And, and then to go back to the States to all the Mickey Mouse stuff was, mm -hmm. was an adjustment for me. And it, you know, oh, yeah, well, I guess we got to do this. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we'd kind of gotten out of that, um, that whole mode there as, as far as uh, all the spit and polish and whatever. All they wanted you to do is, is perform in the field. So that's what we did. You know? mm -hmm. and, uh, Otherwise, you weren't there, and they got rid of you. Now, how long were you at Bragg? Were you there till you were discharged? Yeah, I was there until I was discharged. It, I, I don't remember if it was 11 months or 13 months. It was right around a year. And like basically, all we did was uh, we were either aggressors towards um, this special forces group. We did some of that down in... Uh, well, I was right on the Florida-Georgia border. I forget the name of the the post there, out in the out in the swamps. We formed an aggressor group to uh, to uh, train or, or help train these special forces guys and stuff like that. Did you ever consider going into the special forces? Well, yes, I did. When I was getting, well, I got out in I think it was the end of July. I'm not sure, but I think it was the end of July in '62. Nam was just getting going then, and a, and a few guys I knew and had, had known off and on throughout the service. Uh, I'd been through a lot of stuff with, uh, were signing up, re-enlisting for, uh, for Nam. And the feedback we got was that these guys were going out on patrol without weapons. That doesn't sound like a particular, I mean, they're, you know, they're getting shot at, they're, and, and they're, they were only as basically cadre to, to the South Vietnamese. Uh, you know, they were trying to train the South Vietnamese to, uh, uh, to hold their own, and, and they weren't allowed to carry weapons. I said, man, geez, that don't sound like a particularly good idea to me there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm particularly, I guess I didn't mind being shot at, but I'd like to be able to shoot back a little bit mm -hmm. there. You know? So I kind of kicked that around, and I, I always felt guilty after that that I didn't, but I just, I thought, no, it just didn't seem like it was a smart thing to do at the time. So I, uh, I took my leave of the services and... Uh, <laughs> so you decided not to re-enlist? Yeah, I decided not to re-enlist and go back to fight my way in the, in the civilian world there. <laughs> it, and it, how many jumps had you made? I think around 36, 36 or 38, and... Um, Were you ever injured at all, or...? I, yeah, a couple, I, I messed my knee up one time, which I got some uh, compensation for. Um, 
again, one of these Hollywood jumps, you know, once in a while when, when there's nothing going on. And that's what it was. They threw this jump together. Um, oh, who needs a pay jump? They you know, mm -hmm. call them pay jumps or Hollywood jumps. And, and I did. So they, they got a couple of planes. And the problem was it was a real small DZ that, that we jumped on usually for these things. It was close to the, to the barracks and such. Uh, they didn't have ground communication from ground to air communication. By the time we took off and got over to DZ, the wind had picked up like crazy. And uh, they had no way of stopping the jump. It was way over the limits. So and we come out and I ripped the whole pant leg off. And they had to chase a couple of guys down in Jeeps to collapse their chutes. And it, it was pretty much of a mess. I got that leg screwed up a little bit there. And, um, and then once in, uh, we jumped, was a you know tactical kind of a jump um, down along the marginal line, and I landed in a cell, uh, shell crater, and one of my testicles disappeared for about four days there. Ooh. I couldn't straighten up there for a while. There. I was all bent over, and, and spent a couple of days, uh, about three or four days, in a hospital. But other than that, it was it was pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just nicks and bruising, you know, typical kind of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. No, no serious injuries here. Okay. We, we did lose a few guys here over the course of time, so. Now, any fatalities, or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, one was, well, one guy was, uh, was blown apart by a grenade that was, um, they were moving stuff in the ammo dump. I mean, all we had, the stuff, we, everything we used was Second World War mm -hmm. surplus. Some canister opened, a grenade fell out, he, he got blown apart. Um, another, uh, we had a, a, a big jump, which was the whole, the whole, what was the battle group? Yeah, so there's like 3,200 guys in the air at once. And we had a number of streamers, uh, because the guy below would steal the air from the guy above and whatever. And a couple of them walked away from it, and, and one guy was uh, seriously uh, messed up. Was another guy broke his leg, and we didn't think there was that much wrong with him. Uh, we helped carry him out, and he went away. And we heard later on that they had to take the leg off for some reason. I don't know whether it infected, must have gotten infected or something. But you know, yeah. weird stuff happens. Um, you know, in, in something where you're that active, I guess, or whatever, you got that. But um, it, all in all, I, I you know, I think it was not a lot more dangerous than any other. Mm -hmm. You know, things happen, guys. Automobile accidents all the time. You know, we didn't have that particularly that many of them. Because we did a lot of walking, but mm -hmm. or we had trucking outfits. Really, we we usually we didn't have our own trucks. We had a, a trunk a truck company assigned to us that did most of the driving. I drove a little bit for a while with Jeep because I was one of the older ones, and and I had a my license there. Some kids didn't even have their driver's license for it. Mm -hmm. Server. When we first went to Germany, I drove a Jeep for a while. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was all in all uh, not a bad experience. Now, did you have any problems adapting to civilian life? I thought I would because I drank so much. Uh, but no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Not really, no. No, I was always a little nutsy. I, I, well, what I did do, I guess, to help uh, ease the the transition. I started. I took up skydiving. I did that for a couple of years, and and that kind of got me over the craziness hurdles there a little bit. There, you know, just mm -hmm. to go out and do something wild, you know. So I got. Where did you skydive on? I was uh, Lake Lakewood. It's right alongside Lake Hurst in Jersey, okay. uh, Southern. Well, I start actually. I started out in uh, Stormville, New York. Uh, I passed my free fall tests uh, there. It was a little tiny uh, air for, uh, air, airport. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I had an uncle that lived right almost across the street. So I went up there and visit him and go over and grab a jump or two or whatever. There. We had, mm -hmm. I think, I guess, 10 jumps or something, 10 good jumps that were rated good jumps to, uh, to move you on to, uh, you know, higher heights and longer delays and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I did most of that there, and then I 
can. I hung out. I used to go down to Jersey Shore on weekends and stuff like that. And I'd go over to Lake Lakewood and get a jump or two in and meet them on the beach that afternoon or something like that. You know, just mm -hmm. more specifically. What kind of work did you do at that point? I was a surveyor. I got out. I decided when I was in the service. I, I thought the climbing trees when you're 50 years old doesn't make didn't make a lot of sense to me. I better mm -hmm. figure out what I'm going to do and then. And I had a you know decent background in surveying, so I I went to work for survey outfit, you know, civil engineers and mm -hmm. um, engineering, and I worked in well, I worked on the World Trade Center actually for three years, so we had a pretty I had a pretty varied mm -hmm. uh, just not your regular subdivision or, or mm -hmm. road work or whatever you know. How did you end up in this part of the country? Well, I wanted to I wanted to get out of Jersey. Uh, it was, you could just see it was just building you know, people and whatever I wanted to get away from people. And I just married and uh, thought, well, Colorado would be nice. And oh my gosh, so my wife got a little crazy and she, well, her brother had just moved to upstate New York and he married a girl from Cohoes and they were living in Johnsonville. So she said, what about upstate New York? I don't know. It's not Colorado, but it beats Jersey. So we come out of, we left Jersey for mm -hmm. upstate New York and been here ever since. Mm -hmm. Again, so I worked for C.T. Mail, I worked for uh, Malcolm Pierney, worked for Tom to, uh, Paul Tamell, who used, lives in town here. I don't know if he's still got an office here or not. I kind of lost track of him, but yeah, worked for a couple of different outfits. Mm -hmm. But always, always surveying. Mm -hmm. um, did you stay in touch or contact with anyone you were in the service with? No, no, we kind of kind of all went our separate way. I mean, we're from all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, California, a couple guys that I, I would have liked to stay in touch with were California, from California, so it just, yeah, it just wasn't practical. Mm -hmm. um, I did see, if, uh, I don't know, yeah, I did see a guy down in Ocean City. Um, I, we were, I was working, I was working in Atlantic City, a big sewer job down there. Uh, we'd go down from uh, from North Jersey and spend a week down there. We ended up in this bar in Ocean City, and here's this guy I used to bum out with in, over in Germany there. Uh, his name was Star. He was tending bar there. So, oh, oh, so we had quite a night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but after that, we kind of lost track of each other again. Once we we didn't once I didn't the job was done there, and we uh, we didn't go down there anymore. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. Was interesting, and I, it was, I forget some of it. I've had a couple of places um, where I um, oh, I was in, I was in Germany, um, and I, I took a leave and was down in Berchtesgaden skiing, and I actually hooked up with a guy that uh, I'd been to college with. I was going up the ski lift, and this guy hollered out, "Hey, Hep, what the hell are you doing?" So uh, we had a few days good like that, and then after I was out of service, I was skiing in some other place, and the same thing. A guy come up to me and said, "Weren't the, didn't I ski with you in Burgess Garden?" And it was it was a guy that I had met uh, who was on the ski patrol in uh, in Burgess Garden, and had been in the army, but I hadn't been in the army with him. You know, mm -hmm. it was just something we had met for a week or two. I was down in Burgess Garden, so yeah, but. No, I lost track of some of them. Most of them all there. Mm -hmm. Just uh, they were just from all over the country. You know, it wasn't yeah. like the the days when you know Second World War, where the whole town signed up and and you went over. You know, you stayed almost like a unit. You know, because yeah. uh, at each <clears throat> level you got people from further and further away, or you know, you you eliminated more of the local people because of the fact that they just you know either washed out or went someplace else or whatever. So the higher up the, the training regiment got, uh, the, you know, the, the fewer people you knew, you, mm -hmm. you were thrown into a bigger mix. You know, and uh, and there, I was the only, uh, yeah, I was the only guy from our company that went into uh, went into the Ranger, you know, mm -hmm. group. So it was from the two battle groups that basically uh, the 505 and the 504. So I went there and I didn't know anybody, you know, so you get it started over again. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any really long lasting uh, 
you know, friendship. So you were close to the guys while you were with them. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, ever get to see any sort of USO shows or anything like that? I think there was one. I mean, we were two companies in this concern. Mm -hmm. and that was, so, right, we were not on the mainstream, so to speak. But there were some performers, some singers came once. Um, and everybody had a good time, but no, I didn't, uh, we mm -hmm. didn't see any... Uh, any real USO shows, or, or, as, as you would know them. You know. Bob Hope was not on our, uh, on our, our, we were not on his itinerary, let's uh -huh. say. So, no. Did, did you uh, end up joining any veterans organizations? No, I didn't. Did. No, never did. I was not much of a joiner, I guess. I don't know. Right? Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah, just no, just didn't. Uh, how do you think your time in the service uh, changed or affected your life? Oh, I think it gave me direction. I mean, I was, it, I, it helped me mature. I was, I was very immature when I went in and didn't have a lot of direction. Uh, you know, did a lot of stupid things like young kids do. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think everybody should spend two years in the service. I think the draft should still be in, in effect myself. Um, yeah, I mean, you just, not everybody matures at the same rate, and, and, and it, it's a great buffer for guys that don't know what the hell they want to do or, or how to act even. I mean, there's nothing mm -hmm. like some big old 300-pound master sergeant staring you right in the face and screaming at you to kind of, you know, <laughs> Think you're not the baddest guy on the block, kind of a thing. There, you know. I, yeah, I think it's I think it's great for kids. Myself, I mm -hmm. really do. Um, definitely encourage it, particularly if you don't have direction or you don't know exactly what you want to do. You know, it's it's a good experience. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Well, thanks for wanting to listen to me ramble. There. <laughs>